Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses as we continue with part 13, The Secrecy of Freemasonry, taken from book the first, The Theory of the Mystic Tide by Albert G. Mackey. Part 13, The Secrecy of Freemasonry, to have revealed secrets of men, the secrets of a friend, how heinous had the fact been, how deserving, contempt and scorn of all, to be excluded, all friendship and avoided as a blab, the mark of a fool set on his front, Milton, Samson, Agonistus. Of all the objections urged against our institution, there is none more frequent than that of its secrecy, Ye love darkness because your deeds are evil, is the constant charge of our opponents. Yet how slender is the basis on which this accusation rests. Were we to assign no reason or offer no defense for the secret character of our institution, we would scarcely be asking too much of the uninitiated when we claim their forbearance for, or even their favorable opinion of those mysteries, the knowledge of which have been entrusted to a Washington, the father of his country, to a Lafayette, the early friend of the venerated chief, to a Warren, who on the heights of Bunker poured out his blood as though it had been water for his country's good, to a Franklin, who earned by a life of philanthropic labor the enviable title of the friend of man, to a Clinton, whose rolling principle of conduct was patriotism, and to the innumerable flalix of wise and good and reverend men, whose names have been enrolled among the disciples of Masonry, the society that such men cherished and supported through life could have had no evil ingredient in its constitution. The secrets that they faithfully preserved must have had truth for their foundation and virtue for their copestone. But standing as we do on this vantage ground, we are yet not unwilling to waive its merits and enter fairly into our defense. Why then, to begin, should masonry be denied that safeguard which is not refused to any other association of men? Are there not secrets between the physician and his patient, between the lawyer and his client? between the merchant and his correspondent? Have not all societies their confidential meetings for the transaction of private business, where none but the members dare intrude? What are the secret sessions of the Senate, the secret instructions given to commanders of vessels, the secret consultations of jurymen? The possession of secrets is not then peculiar to Freemasonry. Every trade, every art, and every occupation says Harris, are not to be communicated but to such as have become proficients in the science connected with them, nor then, but with proper caution and restriction, and oftentimes under the guard of heavy penalties. Charters of incorporation are granted by civil governments for their encouragement, Nay, every government, every statesman, and every individual has secrets which are concealed with prudent care and confided only in the trusty and true. It may also be suggested that secrecy and silence were always considered as virtues worthy of cultivation by both the pagan and inspired writers of antiquity. Pythagoras assigned a silence of form two to five years to his pupils as a test of their capacity to receive instruction. Quintus Cortius tells us that among the Persians, a man who could not control his tongue was supposed incapable of performing any great deed, and that they preserved secrets with such wonderful fidelity that neither the allurements of hope nor the compulsion of fear would induce them to betray them. Among the three things which Cato was accustomed to say, that he always repented of when committed, the divulging of a secret was one. Horace devotes a part of one of his most admired odes to a vindication of the obligation of secrecy, and says that he would not permit a man who had betrayed the Eleusinian mysteries. 
the Freemasonry of those times, to remain with him under the same roof or to sail with him in the same frail vessel. Author's note, among the public laws of the Athenians, we find one prescribing death as the penalty for divulging the mysteries. Secrecy was among them a political virtue and its violation was recognized as a crime to be punished by the state. In short, the ancients, who deified every virtue, made a god of silence and secrecy, whom they called Hippocrates, the son of Isis, and represented him in his statues as holding one of his fingers to his mouth to imitate that the mysteries of religion and philosophy were not to be revealed to the uninitiated. Among the inspired writers, we find Solomon eulogizing the keeper of secrets and condemning their betrayer. Whosoever keepeth his mouth and his tongue, say the wise king of Israel, keepeth his soul from troubles. And in another passage, discover not a secret to another, lest he that heareth it put thee to shame, and thine infamy turn not away. On this subject, the son of Sidrach thus wisely and beautifully teaches, Whosoever discovereth secrets, looseth his credit, and shall never find a friend to his mind. Love thy friend, and be faithful unto him. But if thou betrayest his secrets, follow no more after him. For as a man hath destroyed his enemy, so hast thou lost the love of thy neighbor. As one that letteth a bird go out of his hand, so hast thou let thy neighbor go, and shall not get him again. Follow after him no more, for he is too far off. He is as a roe escaped out of the snare, as for a wound it may be bound up, and after reviling there may be reconcilement, but he that betrayeth secrets is without hope. Coming then to our conclusions, upon the principle of analogy with other institutions, I think it must be admitted that if the secrets of Freemasonry are not criminal in their character and design, there can be nothing objectionable in the naked abstract fact of their secrecy. Now that our secrets are at least harmless, may most undoubtedly be inferred from the many irreproachable men to whom they have been entrusted. But we have another ground of defense. The secrets of Freemasonry are essential to the very existence and utility of the institution. Without these secrets, which constitute the universal language of Masonry, the great objects of assistance, protection, and brotherly kindness to the unknown and destitute stranger could not be affected for want of a certain mode of recognition. This great advantage of the society would, therefore, be lost. Its claims upon the affection and attachment of its members would be lessened and its power of doing good impaired. The importance of secrecy with us, says Hutchinson, in such that we may not be deceived in dispensing our charities, that we may not be betrayed in the tenderness of our benevolence, or that others may not usurp the portion which is prepared for those of our own family, besides as something more than the influence of a general and indiscriminating affection is necessary to excite men to deeds of active benevolence and loving kindness, this something necessary to serve as a tie, which shall give Freemasons a warmer interest in each other, is to be found in the secrets of the institution, of which the members only are the common participators. Secrecy is, in short, the casket in which the jewels of Freemasonry are kept for better preservation. Who shall blame us? for having thus disposed them in a place of security and locked them up in the safe depository of faithful breast. But the truth, after all, is that we have no secrets which we keep from the worthy and deserving who choose to ask for them. The good and worthy, 
says an author whom I've cited before, may come among us. Our doings are displayed before them, and it is too much to hear any complain of ignorance or speak evil of a science which they want the inclination or the capacity or the qualification to understand. To him whose character is without blemish and whose conduct is, as our antiquated language expresses it, under the tongue of good report, the portals of our lodge are ever open. Let him ask, and he shall receive. Let him seek, and he shall find. Let him knock, and it shall be opened unto him. And when he has entered, he will find there traditions which may enlarge his knowledge, doctrines which may improve his heart, and precepts which may strengthen his piety, and these preserved, impressed, and enforced by appropriate ceremonies which require, for their due appreciation, the necessary preparations of silence, secrecy, and solemnity. Thank you for watching, and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Rosies. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.